Good morning. We are reading The Last Vampire. Black Blood. This is chapter 10. Now, for those of you who are interested, here is the the uh, what do you call it? The book synopsis. Let me let me pull it up. Uh, let me see. The last vampire. Black. Blood. Let's see if it pulls up. Uh, here we go. A synopsis? No? Oh well. Believing that she, that Alyssa, and her partner, Ray, are the last remaining vampires, 5,000-year-old Alyssa is stunned when she learns about a series of brutal murders in the United States that can only be the work of their own kind. All right, here we go. I stand on a vast grass field of many gently sloping hills. It is night, yet the sky is bright. There is no sun, but a hundred blazing blue stars, each shimmering in a long river of nebulous cloud. The air is warm, pleasant, fragrant, with the perfume of a thousand invisible flowers. In the distance, a stream of people walk toward a large vessel, of some type. Nestled between the hills, the ship is violet, glowing. The bright rays that stab forth from it seem to reach to the stars. Somehow I know that it is about to leave, and that I am supposed to be on it. Yet, before I depart, there is something I have to discuss with Lord Krishna. He stands beside me on the wide plain, his gold flute in his right hand, a red lotus flower in his left. His dress is simple, as is mine, long blue gowns that reach to the ground. Only he wears a single jewel around his neck, the brilliant Kastuba gem, in which the destiny of every soul can be seen. He does not look at me, but toward the vast ship and the stars beyond. He seems to be waiting for me to speak, but for some reason I cannot remember what he said last. I only know that I am a special case, because I do not know what to ask. I say what is most on my mind. When will I see you again, my lord? He gestures to the vast plain, the thousands of people leaving. The earth is a place of time and dimension. Moments here can seem like an eternity there. It all depends on your heart. When you remember me, I am there in the blink of an eye, even on earth. He nods, especially there. It is a unique place. Even the gods pray to take birth there. Why is that, my lord? He smiles faintly. His smile is bewitching. It has been said, I know, that the smile of the Lord has bewildered the minds of the angels. It has bewildered mine. One question always leads to another. Question. Some things are better to wonder about. He turns toward me finally his long black hair blowing in the soft night breeze. The stars reflect in his black pupils. The whole universe is there. 
The love that flows from him is the sweetest ambrosia in all the heavens. Yet it breaks my heart to, to feel because I know I will soon be gone. It will all Maya, he says. Illusion. Will I get lost in this illusion, my lord? Of course. It is to be expected. You'll be lost for a long time. I will forget you? Yes. I feel tears on my face. Why does it have to be that way? He considers. There was this great god who was the master of a vast ocean. This ocean, you may not know its name, but it is very near to here. This god had three wives. You know how hard it is to please one wife? You can Im <laughs> you can imagine how difficult it was to keep all three happy. Not long after he married the three, two of them came to him and asked for gifts. The first one said, Oh, great Lord, we are the finest of your wives, the most beautiful. Reward us with special presents, and we will be most pleased. And the second one said, We have served you faithfully, and have none other than you. Give us treasures, and we will stay with you for the rest of your life. The god laughed at their request, but because he was pleased with them, he fulfilled their wishes. The first he gave all the jewels in his oceans, the diamonds, the emeralds, the uh, the sapphires. To the second, he gave all the colored coral, all the beautiful seashells. The third wife, of course, asked for nothing in particular. So he gave her the salt. The salt, my lord? Is that all? Mm, the symbolism. Yes, because she asked nothing from him, he gave her the salt, which she spread out in the ocean. All the bright jewels became invisible, and all the pretty seashells were covered over. And the first two wives were unable to find their treasures, so were left with nothing. So you see, the salt was the greatest of the gifts, or at least the most powerful. Krishna pauses. You understand this story, Sita? I hesitate. There are always many meanings in his stories, yes. This nearby ocean is the creation we are about to enter. The salt is the maya, the illusion, that covers its treasure. Krishna nods, yes. But understand that these treasures are not evil, and the goddess who own, who own them are not simply vain. Dive deep into the ocean, and they will cause currents to stir, and will lead you to things you cannot imagine. He pauses and then continues in a softer voice, one more looking at the sky. I dreamed of the earth, and that is how it came to be. In my dream, I saw you there. He reaches out his hand and touches my hair, and I feel... I will swoon. You go there to learn things that only earth can teach. That is the truth, but is also false. All of truth is paradoxical. With me, there is never any coming or going. Do you understand? No, my lord. He removes his hand. It doesn't matter. You are like the earth, unique. But unlike the others you see before you, you will not come and go there many times. In your dream and mine, you will go there and stay. For how long, my lord? You will be born at the beginning of one age. You will not leave until the next age comes. My tears return. In all that time, I am never to see you. You will see me not long after you are changed. Then it is possible you may see me again before you leave the earth. 
Krishna smiles. It is all up to you. I do not understand what he means by change, but I ha but have more pressing concerns, but I don't want to go at all. He laughs so easily. You say that now. You will not say that later. His eyes hold mine for what seems a moment, but perhaps is much longer. In that brief span, I see many faces, many stars. It is as if the whole universe spins below and completes an entire revolution. But I have not left the hilltop. I continue to stare into Krishna's eyes. Or are they really eyes and not windows into a portion of myself that I have st striven so hard to reclaim? A tiny globe of light emerges from his eyes and floats into mine. A living world of many forms and shapes. He speaks to me in a whisper. How do you feel now, Sita? I raise my hand to my head, dizzy. I feel somehow as if I have just lived. I stop. I feel as if I have already been on earth and been married and had a child. It is all so strange. I feel as if I had been something other than human. Is that possible? He nods. You will be human for only a short time. And yes, it has all happened already. You see... That is the Maya. You think what you have to do to accomplish the perfect yourself to reach me. But there is no doership. You are always with me, and I am always with you. Still, it is deep in your in your heart to be different from the rest, to try to try to try to do in one long, long life what it takes others thousands of lives to accomplish. So be it. You are an angel, but you wish to be like me. But I am both angel and demon, good and evil. Yet I am above all these things. Dive deep into the ocean, Sita, and you will find the greatest treasures you find are the illusions you leave behind. I do not understand. It doesn't matter. He raises his flute to his lips. Now I play you a song made up of the seven notes of humanity, all the emotions you will feel as a human and as a vampire. Remember this song, and you will remember me. Sing this song, and I will be there. Wait, what is a vampire? But Krishna has already started to play. As I strive to listen, and sudden wine comes up, on the plain and the notes are drowned out. The dust rises and I am blinded. I cannot, I can't see Krishna anymore. I can't feel him near. The light of the stars fades and all goes dark. And my sorrow is great. Yet I have to wonder if I have lost the song because I have become the song. If I have lost my Lord because I do indeed desire to do what I will become, a lover who hates, a saint who sins, and an angel who kills. I awake to a world I don't want. There is no transition for me. I am in paradise. I am in hell. Hello, a voice says. Actually, I, I, I am in a cheap motel, looking around. I see a chipped chest of drawers, a dusty mirror that reflects bare walls, a dumpy mattress. It is on this mattress that I lay, naked, covered with a sheet. In this, ref in this reflection, I also see Special Agent Joel Drake, who sits on a chair near the window and waits anxiously for me to respond to his quarry, but I say nothing at first. Ray is dead. I know this. I feel this. Yet, at the same time, I hurt too much to feel anything. 
I hear my heart pump inside my chest. It cannot belong to me. However, in my long life, I have drunk the blood of thousands. But now, I am an empty vessel. I shiver, even though the room is warm. Yes, I say, finally. See, Deb? In the mirror, I watch the reflection of Joel come and sit on the bed beside me. The soggy springs respond to his weight, to the weight, and my body sags in the middle. Are you all right? He asks. Yes. You're in a motel. I took you here after the explosion at the warehouse. That was 12 hours ago. You have slept away the entire day. Yes. He speaks without believing his own words. I followed in your footsteps. I went to see the mother. She was in a strange state, incoherent, like a broken record. She kept repeating the location of the warehouse that blew up. She said little else. Yes, clearly I pushed the mother's brain too, too hard, etched my suggestion in her psyche, set up an echo. I have done this in the past, and the effort is seldom permanent. The woman will probably be all right in a day or two. Not that I care. I immediately drove to the warehouse, Joel continues. When I got there, you and your partner were confronting that guy. I was running over just as the explosion happened. He pauses. You were th thrown free, but I was sure you were dead. You hit a brick wall with incredible force, and your clothes were all on fire. I covered you with my coat and put out the flames. Then I saw that you were still breathing. I load you in my car and was taking you to the hospital when I noticed. I saw with my own eyes he was he has trouble speaking. You started to heal. Right there in front of me, the cuts on your face closed and your back. It had to be broken in a hundred places, just snipped back together. I thought to myself, this is impossible. I can't take her to a hospital. They'll want to lock her away for the next ten years for observation. He stops. So I brought you here. Are you following this? Are you following this? Yes. He is getting desperate. Tell me what's happening here. Who are you? I continue to stare in the mirror. I don't want to ask the question. Simply to ask is to be weak. And I am also always strong. It is not as though I have any hope. Yet I ask anyway. The young man near the truck. I begin. Your partner. The guy who was on fire. Yes, I swallow. My throat is dry. Was he thrown free? Uh, Joel softens. No. Are you sure? Yes. But is he dead? Joel understands what I am saying. My partner was like me, not normal. Even severely injured, he could have healed. But Joel shakes his head. I know Ray was blown to pieces. He's dead, Joel says. I understand. I sit up and cough weakly. Joel brings me a glass of water. As I touch the rim of the glass to my lips, a drop of red stains the clear liquid. But the color does not come from my mouth or nose. It is a bloody tear. Seldom have I ever cried. This must be a special occasion. Joel hesitates. Was he your boy boyfriend? I nod. I'm sorry. The words really do not help me. Did both tankers at both ends of the warehouse blow? Yes. Did you see anyone run out of the warehouse after the explosion? No. That would have been impossible. It was an inferno. The police are still going through the mess, picking out the charred bodies. They've cor uh, cordoned off the whole area. He pauses. 
Did you see those tankers blow? Yes. Why? Why? To kill those inside. They were, they were your killers. But I don't want to talk about that now. What about the other man? The one that was your boyfriend. And me. Did he get away? I don't know where he went. He was just gone. <laughs> that means he got away. What? Who was that man, Joel asked. I'm sure you can guess. Edward Fender. I nod. Eddie. Joel sits back and stares at me. At this young woman whose body was crushed 12 hours ago and who now appears completely well except for a few bloody tears. I note the dark sky through the cracked window, a glow of neon signaling the beginning of another long night. He wants me to tell me why, but I am asking myself the same question. Why did it take 5,000 years to find someone to love again? Why was he taken from me after only six weeks? Why time and space, Krishna? You erect these walls around us and then close us in. Especially when those we love leave us. Then the walls are too high. And no, and no matter how hard we jump, we cannot see beyond them. Then all we have are walls falling in on us. I do not believe my dream. Life is not a song. Life is a curse. And no one's life has been longer than mine. How did you heal so fast? Joel asked me. I told you. I am not normal. He trembles. Are you a human being? Wiping away my bloody tears, I chuckle bitterly. What? What was that in my dream? The part about wanting to be different, high ironic, and foolish. It was as if I were a child going to sleep at night and asking my mother if if I could please have a horrible nightmare. Ordinarily, I would say no, I reply. But since I'm crying and that's a thing human often do, then maybe I should say yes. I stare down at my red stained hands and feel his eyes on them as well. What do you think? He takes my hands in his and studies them closer. He is still trying to convince himself that the reality has not suddenly developed a pronounced rip. You're bleeding. You must still be injured. I take my hand back and wave away the, his question. I am this way. It is normal for me. I have to wipe my cheeks again. These tears, I cannot stop them. Elsewhere, I go, I go, everything I touch, there is blood. Sita, I sit up sharply. Don't call me that. I'm not her. Do you, do you understand? She died a long time ago. <clears throat> I am this thing you see before you. This, this bloody thing. Not minding my nakedness, I stand and walk to the window, stepping over my burnt clothes, lying on the floor in a pile. He must have peeled them off me. The material is sticky with charred flesh. Pulling the curtain further aside, I stare at it, out a landscape that looks as foreign from the world of my dream as another galaxy. We cannot be far from the warehouse. We are still in the ghetto, still on the enemy's turf. I wonder what he's going to do right now, I mutter. Joel stands at my back. While you rested, I went out and bought you some clothes. He gestures to a bag sitting on a chair in the corner. I don't know if they will fit. Thank you. I go to the corner and put them on. Blue jeans gray sweatshirt. They fit fine. <clears throat> they are, there are no shoes, but I don't need them. I notice my knife sitting on the chair beneath the bag. However, the leather strap that I used to secure it to my leg is not there. 
I put it in my back pocket instead. It sticks out a few inches. Joel follows my moves with fear in his eyes. What are you going to do? He asks. Find him. Kill him. Joel takes a step toward me. You have to talk to me. I shake my head. I cannot. I tried to talk to you on the pier, and you, st and you still follow me. I suspect you will try to follow me again, but I understand that. You're just trying to do your job. I'm just trying to do mine. I turn toward the door. It'll be over soon enough, one way or the other. He stops me as I reach for the knob, even after all he has seen of me. He is a brave man. I do not shake his hand from my arm. Instead, I stare into his eyes, but without the intention of manipulation, the desire to control. I stare at him so that he can stare at me without Ray for the first time in a long time. I feel so lonely, so human. He sees my pain. What would you like me to call you? He asked gently. I make a face. Without the mirror, I don't know if it is very pleasant. You may call me Sita if you wish, Joel. I want to help you, Sita. You cannot help me. I've explained to you why, and now you've seen why, I add. I don't want you to get killed. He is anxious. <coughs> it must mean he likes me. This bloody thing. I don't want you to get killed. I may not have your special attributes, but I am an experienced law enforcement officer. We should go after him together. A gun won't stop him. I have more to offer than a gun. I smile faintly and reach up to touch his cheek. Once again, I think what a fine man he is. Consumed with doubts and questions, he still wants to do his duty. He still wants to be with me. I can make you forget, I say to him. I saw how I affected the mother's mind. I can do that kind of thing. But I don't want to do it to you, even now. I want you just to go away from here. Get away from me and forget any of this ever happened. I take my hand back. This is the most human thing I can tell you, Joel. He finally lets go of my arm. Will I see you again? He asks. I am sad. I hope not. And I don't mean that cruelly. Goodbye. Goodbye. I walk out the door and close it behind me. The night is not as warm as I like it, nor is it cold, as I hate. It is cool and dark, a fine time for a vampire to go hunting. Later, I tell myself, I will grieve for Ray. Now, there is too much to do. Okay, we are now starting chapter 11. On foot, I returned to the vicinity of the warehouse, but as Joel said, the entire air area is condoned off by numerous police officers. From, se from several blocks away, I studied the remains of the warehouse with my acute vision, perhaps subconsciously searching for the remains of Ray. The investigative crew, however, is working the ruins. Whatever was lying around outside has already been picked up and deposited into plastic bags with bags with white labels on them. With the many flashing red lights, the mounds of ash, and the ruined bodies, the scene depresses me. Still, I do not turn away from it. I am thinking, but what he... But what he did do was heather up in his bedroom closet, standing up, wearing his high school letter jacket and nothing else, and force her to suck the popsicles all night. 
The night I met the newborn vampires, I heard an ice cream truck in the vicinity, its repetitive jingle playing loudly in the middle of December, in the middle of the night. Then, when I visited Mrs. Fen Fender, I learned she had a large freezer in her house. Finally, after parking my tanker outside the warehouse, I saw out of the corner of my eye an ice cream truck. From where I stand now, I cannot see the same spot to tell if the truck is still there. But with the security in the area, I think that it might be there. And I believe that it might be important. Okay. It is important. So what is in the ice cream truck? Mm. Any ideas? What kind of thing did Eddie have about popsicles? What kind of fetish did he have about frozen corpses? Were the fetishes related? If Eddie did get his hands on Yaksha's remains and Yaksha was still alive, where Eddie would have been would have been forced to keep Yaksha in a weakened state to control him. There are two ways to do that, at least. Only two that I know of. One is to keep Yaksha impaled with a number of sharp objects that his skin cannot heal around. The other is more subtle and deals with the nature of vampires themselves. Yaksha was the incarnation of Yakshini, a demonic serpent being. Snakes are cold-blooded and do not like the cold. In the same way, vampires hate the cold, although we can withstand it. Yet ice thwarts us as much as the sun slowing down our mental processes, hampering our ability to recover from serious wounds. Going by Eddie's obvious strength and knowledge of my identity, I hypothesize that he has indeed gotten hold of Yaksha alive and is keeping him in an extremely weak state while he continues to drink his blood. I suspect Eddie keeps him impaled and half frozen, but where? At home with Mom? Doubtful. Mom is crazy and Yaksha is a treasure too dangerous to leave lying around. Eddie would keep his blood supply close. He would even take it with him when he went out hunting at night. I find a phone booth nearby and call Sally Diedrich before leaving the coroner's office. I had obtained her home and work number. I am not in the mood for idle gossip, so I come right to the point before going into the stiff business. Did Eddie used to be an ice cream man? As a matter of fact, yes, Sally replies. He and his mom owned a small ice cream truck business in the Los Angeles area. That's all I wanted to know. Next, I call Pat McQueen, Ray's old girlfriend. I don't know why I do it. She's not someone I can share my grief with, and besides, I do not believe such a thing should be shared. Yet, on this darkest of all nights, I feel the affinity with her. I stole her love, and now fate has stolen mine. Maybe it is justice. Die on the number, I wonder if I call to apologize or to antagonize her. I remind myself that she thinks Ray perished six weeks ago. My call will not be welcome. I may just open wounds that have already begun, begun to close. Still, I do not hang up when she answers after a couple of rings. Hello. Hello, Pat. This is Alyssa. I'm sure you remember me. She gasps, then falls into a worry silence. She hates me, I know, and wants to hang up, but she is curious. What do you want, she asks. I don't know. I stand here asking myself the same question. I guess I just wanted to talk to someone who knew Ray well. There is a long silence. I thought you were dead. So did I. 
and even longer pause. I know what she will ask. It, he is, isn't he? I know my head. I bowed my head, yes. But his death was not just an accident. He died bravely by his own choice, trying to protect what he believed in. She begins to weep. <laughs> Did he believe in you? She asked bitterly. Yes, I like to think so. He believed in you as well. I just want to check the time. Uh, oh, uh, I, I, he believed in you as well. His feelings for you went very deep. He did not leave you willingly. I forced him. Why? Why could you just leave us alone? I loved him. But you killed him. He would be alive now if you never even spoken to him. I sighed. I know that. But I did not know what I... What would happen? Had I known, I would never have done the things. I would have done things completely different. Please believe me, Pat. I did not want to hurt you or him. It just worked out that way. She continues to cry. You're a monster. The pain in my chest is great. Yes, I can't forget him. I can't forget this. I hate you. You can't hate me. You can hate me. That's all right. But you don't need to forget him. You won't be able to anyway. Nor will I be able to. Pat, maybe I do know why I called you. I think it was to tell you that his death does not necessarily mean the end of him. You see, I think I met Ray long ago. In another place, another dimension. And that day at school, when we all introduced ourselves, it was like magic. He was gone. But he came back. He can come back again, I think. Or at least, we can go to him. To the stars. She begins to be too quiet. I don't know what you're talking about. I force a smile for myself. It doesn't matter. We both loved him, and he and he's gone. And who knows if there's anything else? No one knows. Have a good night, Pat. Have sweet dreams. Dream about him. I know I will for a long time. She hesitates. Goodbye, Alyssa. Hanging up, I stare at the ground. It is closer than the sky, and at least I know it is real. Clouds hang overhead anyway, and there's no stars tonight. I call my old friend Seymour. He answers quickly, and I tell him everything that has happened. He listens without interrupting. That's what I like about him. In his world of gossip, and good, a good listener is rarer than a great orator. He is silent when I finish. He knows... He cannot console me, and he doesn't really try. I respect that as well, but he, do, he does acknowledge the loss. Too bad about Ray, he says. Yeah, real bad. Are you all right? Yes. His voice is firm. Good. You have to stop this bastard. I agree with you. Yaksha is probably in that ice cream truck. All the signs point in that direction. Why didn't you wait until you checked it out before calling me? Because if he is in there and I get him away from Eddie and the cops, I won't be of mine to make phone calls. Good. Get Yaksha. He'll heal quickly and then the two of you can go after Eddie. I don't think it'll be that easy. Seymour pauses. His legs won't grow back. This might surprise you, but I don't have a lot of experience in such matters. But I doubt it. That's not good. You'll have to face Eddie alone. And I, do, I didn't do so well last time. You did well. 
You destroyed his partners, but you have to act fast or he will make more. And this time he will not allow them to gather in one place and be so easily wiped out. But I cannot beat him by force. I have proved that to myself already. He is just too fast, too strong. He is also smart. But you are smart too. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. I can only give you some hints. You have to place him in a situation where your advantages are magnified. He probably cannot see and hear as well as you. He is probably more sensitive to the sun. The sun didn't slow him down much. Well, he be more he may be more sensitive to cold than you. I suspect that he he is and doesn't know it. He certainly seems sensitive when it comes to his mother. <coughs> He's what? Thirty years old? He's a vampire. And he's still living at home. That guy can't be that fearsome. I appreciate the humor, but give me something. Take her hostage. Threaten to kill her. He'll come run it. Come a running. I have thought of that. Then do it. But get Yaksha away from him first. I think it's Yaksha who can give you the secret of how to stop him. You read and write too many books. Do you really think? Oh my god. I lost my place. Uh, you really think it's Yaksha who can give you the secret of how to stop him? Oh, Alright, there we go. Uh, do you really think there is a magical secret? You are magic, Sita. You are full of secrets you don't even know. Krishna let you live for a reason. You have to find that reason. And this situation will resolve itself automatically. His words move me. I have not told him of my dream. Still, my doubts and my pain are too heavy for words alone to wash away. Krishna is full of mischief, I say. Sometimes so... The stories went. He did things for no reason at all. Just because he wanted to. Then you be mischievous. Trick Eddie. The football player at our school. Are all bigger and stronger than I am. But they're all a bunch of fools. I could whip their asses any day. If I survive this night. And tomorrow night. I will hold you. That, that proud boast. I might tell your football team exactly what you said about them. Fair enough. He softens. Ray was enough. Don't die on me, Sita. I'm close to tears again. I will call you the first chance I get. Promise. Cross my heart, heart and hope to die. He groans. But he's, he is frightened for me. Take care. Sure, I say. Sneaking into the security area is not difficult. I simply leap from one rooftop to the next when no one is looking. But getting out with an ice cream truck in tow will not be so easy. There are police cars parked crossways at every exit. Nevertheless, that is the least of my worries. Moving slightly a hundred feet above the ground, I see that the ice cream truck is still in place. A palpable aura of pain surrounds it like a swarm of black insects above a body that has lain unburied. Dread weighs heavily on me. As I leap from my high perch and land on the concrete sidewalk beside the truck, I feel as if I have just jumped into a black well filled with squirming snakes. No one stands in the immediate vicinity, but the odor of venom is thick in the air. Even before I pull aside the locked door to the refrigerated compartment, I know that Yaksha is inside and in poor condition. 
I open the door. Yaksha, I whisper. There is movement at the back of the cold box. A strange shape speaks. What favor would you like, little girl? Yaksha asks in a tired voice. My reaction is a surprise to me, probably because I feared him for so long. It is difficult for me to eat, even to approach him without hesitation. Even while seeking him out as an ally, yet with this, with his silly question, a wave of warmth sweeps over me. Still, I do not stare too hard at what he has become. I do I do not want to know, at least not yet. I will get you out of here, I say. Give me ten minutes. You can take fifteen if you need, Sita. I close the compartment door. Only police cars are allowed in and out of the air. Not even the press has gotten through the roadblocks, which is understandable. It is not every day. Twenty plus bodies are incinerated in Los Angeles. Although, on the other hand, it is not the unusual uh, an occurrence in this part of town. My course is clear. I will get myself a police car, maybe a navy blue police cap to cover my blonde hair. I walk casually in the direction of the warehouse, when who do I run into but the two cops who stop me outside the Coliseum, Detective Donut and his young prodigy. They blink when they see me, and I have to refrain from laughing. A box of donuts is set out on the hood of their black and white unit, and they are casually sipping coffee from uh, styrofoam cups. We are still a block from where all the action is going on, relatively isolated from you. The situation appeals to be to my devilish nature. Fancy me and you here, I say. They scramble to set down their nourishment. What are you doing here? The older cop asked politely. This is a restricted area. I am bold. You make this place sound like a nuclear submarine. We're serious, the young, young one says. You'd best get out of here quick. I move closer. I will leave as soon as you give me your, key, your car keys. They exchange a smile. The older one nods in my direction. Haven't you seen the news? Don't you know what happened here? Yeah, I heard an atomic bomb went off. I stick out my hand. But give me the keys, really. I'm in a big hurry. The young one puts his hands on his nightstick like he would really need it with a 98-pound young woman who looks all of 20. Of course, he would need a uh, Bra Bradley truck to stop me. The guy has a phony prep school demeanor, and I, I peg him for a rich dropout who couldn't get into law school, and so joined the force to annoy Daddy. We're running out of patience, Preppy says, acting the tough guy. Leave immediately, or we're hauling your tight ass in. My tight ass? What about the rest of me? That sounds like a sexist statement, if I ever heard one. I move within two feet of Preppy and stare him in the eye, trying hard not to burn it out of its, out of its socket. You know I have nothing against cops, but I can't stand sexist pigs. They piss me off, and then I get pissed off there's no stopping me. I poke the guy in the chest hard. You apologize to me right now, or I'm going to whip your ass. To my surprise, I could pass, after all, for a high school senior. He pulls his gun on me. Back off a, a pace, as if shocked, I raise my arms over my head. The older cop takes an attentive step in our direction. 
He is more experienced. He knows it is always a bad idea to go looking for trouble where trouble does, does not exist. Yet he does not know what trouble is. He does not know that trouble is my middle name. Hey, Gary, he says, leave the girl alone. She's just flirting with you is all. Put away your gun. Gary does not listen. She's got a pretty dirty mouth for a flirt. How do you know she's not a prostitute? Yeah, that's right. Maybe she is. Maybe we should haul her tight ass in on a charge of soliciting sexual favors for money. I haven't offered you any money, I say. That angers Gary. He shakes his gun at my belly. You get up against that wall and spread your legs, Gar Gary. The old, old cop complains. Stop it. All right. I need to stop. Okay. So, yeah. I need to stop. But, we'll probably finish this book. Like, either tomorrow or Monday. We'll have to see. So, time for a little self-promotion. I am the YA horror author of Vampire Juice. It is a... It is a mystery adventure with plenty of laughs vampires and a little bit and it is spooky and creepy like fear street or the lost boys and here is my little book synopsis a man and sean stumble upon a mysterious can of juice while searching for Halloween costumes at a local store, despite being kicked out by the sales clerk, they become obsessed with uncovering the truth behind the strange drink. With the help, with the help from some local bullies, they sneak back into the store through a crypt in the graveyard, only to find themselves in the midst of a spine-chilling adventure. Now. Yeah. Uh, just a quick note. I need more reviews on this book. And so I have made it free for the next five days. Starting today through Monday, it will be free. All right. With that, thanks for watching. And we will continue our story of The Last Vampire Black Blood.